Thank you. <coughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, the deportation laws enacted on 26 May 1915, which resulted in the death of at least 800,000 Armenians in the Ottoman Empire involved in World War I, are still an important topic of diplomatic negotiations concerning Turkey. The political, social, and historical controversy around the bloody events that started 97 years ago and defined by the Entente powers in 1915 as crime against whom humanity is going on heatedly to this day. Although the views have become more sophisticated over the decades, there is still a wide gap between the Western and the Turkish interpretations of World War I events. Instead of discussing the incidents and precedents of what is legally condemned as genocide in more and more countries in the West, while persistently qualified as deportation or civil war in Turkey, I am going to outline the aftermath of the events, the phases of the development of the two different interpretations, and their effects on politics and society. The think tanks of the Turkish Republic proclaimed on the ruins of the Ottoman Empire always adjusted their opinion on 1915 to the current diplomatic and foreign political events, but the official stances taken in the course of the 20th century can be divided into three groups. The boundaries of the periods called Ottoman investigative uh, narrative, Republican defensive, and post-national critical narrative by the famous genocide researcher Donald Blacksham are marked by important events in the world politics, notably the declaration of the Turkish Republic, World War II, and the collapse of the Soviet Union. The first phase, characterized by Ottoman investigative narrative, stretches between the armistice of Mudros, terminating the World War I, and the introduction of the Atatürk state and encompasses the memoirs reports court proceedings containing the views of high-ranking Ottoman officials on the causes of anti-Armenian action, uh, actions. They include the recollection of Said, Kiamil, and Talat Pashas, the documents of legal actions taken against the presumed perpetrators of the British occupation of Istanbul, and the official reports of the Ottoman government. This set of documents represents basically two different approaches. The supporters of the old regime express that view that the so-called millet system applied in the Ottoman Empire adequately guaranteed the rights of the minorities, so the Christians, including the Armenians, had no right to revolt against the state, despite some minor defects in the system. As the termination of the Turkish war of independence was drawing close, the opinion that the murderers had acted in defense of the Muslims of Turkey and the Anatolian motherland against the traitor and their Western incitors was gaining ground. What is common to these two narratives is their reluctance to name the murderers and those who order the massacres, which already implies the possibility to hold the victims themselves responsible for the atrocities later. The second large period lasted from the early 50s to the early 90s, from the U.S. resolution after the World War II to the fall of the socialist systems. However, it is not negligible what happened in the 30 years separating the two periods. In the first decades of the Republic, a lot of external and domestic factors hindered the elaboration of the World War I events. They include the political, economic, and social chaos caused by nine years of warfare, the infiltration of functionaries of Committee of Union and Progress in the state machinery of the Republic, the sweeping reforms launched by Mustafa Kemal, and later the threat of the Second World War for several years. A single event of signal importance was Atatürk's parliamentary speech lasting 36 hours in 1927, the Nutuk, in which he narrated the story of the world war of independence from his own angle, thereby discrediting any other concept of history in Turkish political and scientific discourse for decades. What is more, by starting his speech with his arrival in Samsung in 1990, all preceding events become, became qualified as belonging to the category of necessary evil of prehistory, leading to the proclamation of the Republic. The beginning of the Republican defensive narrative is marked by the appearance of Esad Uras, the Armenians in history and the Armenian question, and Yege Charles, the Armenians on the service of Turkey state in 1953, or if you want, uh, uh, the Turkish uh, name of these books are uh, um, uh, the, mm, the other side, I forget, sorry. So, 
Capitalizing on the more, more liberal atmosphere, after the fall of the state party led by Ismail Tidoni, the authors tried to prove in response to the UN resolution of 1948 that the events between 1915 and 1917 were no genocide. The ensuing Turkish and pro-Turkish words that adopted this position addressed themselves to the relocation of the Armenians in line with the time-tested Ottoman custom, to the situation of an actual civil war, and to the great powers' imperialist and Armenians' nationalist efforts before the World War. It must be added that the murder of Turkish diplomats and their families by Asala and other Armenian terrorist groups between 1973 and 1985 poured much oil on the fire of this position. Although the silence of the 60s and 70s, which was owned mainly by the censorship brought by the two military coups, appeared to be broken by the Armenian action, Voices only strengthened from the mid-80s. In the intensification of the international pressure, the Turks spared no time or effort to publish books on the secret organization of the Armenians prior to World War I. In addition, they granted considerable support to Western historians who were willing to support the Turkish position and used diplomatic pressure and stress to prevent exhibitions and conferences that would have been concerned with the fate of the Armenians. The major changes of the 90s shook the foundation of the Turkish position that were believed to be firm and unshakable. Turkey, as the easternmost stronghold of NATO during the Cold War, whose domestic affairs was practically controlled by the CIA, began to lose its strategic significance. In this situation, the European countries passed resolution acknowledging the Armenian massacres as genocide one after the other. Though some hope arose for the normalization of Turkish-Armenian relations, with the outbreak of the Armenian as a reward for the province of Karabakh, rapprochement between the two countries was made impossible for decades. Having Europe in mind, Turkey had to realize that the precondition for EU integration was the elaboration of the past as fast as possible. Owing partly to this, works of a more critical tone are also appearing now after the earlier dogmatic books. This post-nationalist critical narrative characterizes the present, when the nationalist stance may also go together with the open recognition of the responsibility of the Ottoman Turks. This is also demonstrable at the level of society. After the killing of the Armenian journalist of, Ran of Istanbul, Randing, tens of thousands of Turks took part in mass demonstrations with posters claiming, we are all Randing. We may also recall the commemorations three years ago at Haidar Pasha railway station, to pay tribute to the memory of the Armenian leader's Putin train on 24 April 1915. The most outstanding event in the political sphere was the signing in Switzerland in 2009 of the Armenian-Turkish Memorandum, which, however, is still awaiting mutual ratification. Today's official Turkish position is perhaps most accurately summed up by the words of Prime Minister Recep Tayyip Erdogan, who said to the question of a German paper, Turkey does not does not deny the sufferings of the Armenians, but we repudiate the accusation that Turkey had committed genocide. We hope that the Committee of Armenian and Turkish Historians that was set up as an outcome of the Zurich Protocol will play an important role. After Turkey, let us see the voices of the West, so Europe, America, Armenia and Israel. Though being less changeable over the decades, their positions were also subject to the paramount interests of global political and military strategic considerations. After the analogy of Swiss historian Hans Lukas Kieser, the events of the past nearly 100 years can be divided into five shorter periods from a Western viewpoint. I touch briefly on the first three and then discuss the last two in more detail. The first phase rests on the World War I reports and the first hand recollections of missionaries embassy personnel, and the military officer, officers. The second group contains literary and scientific works on the Armenians, with the special emphasis of France warfare the 40 days of Usada. The third phase stretches with, between the UN resolution and the late 60s. Mention must be made of a great demonstration in Yerevan on the 50th anniversary of the events, with the participation of tens of thousands of Armenians. It is to be noted at this juncture that Khrushchev, who supported the demonstration, wished to pursue Stalin's Armenian policy. That means in practice massive support by the Soviet leaders for the Armenian demand to revise the Lausanne Peace Treaty and replace it with the territorially far more advantageous resolutions of the Sev Treaty. After the World War, this effort was evidently not backed up by the USA, the leading European powers of Turkey. 
The beginning of the fourth phase is marked by the manhunt, manhunt carried out against dozens of Turkish diplomats by GCO, AG, and Asala. To a certain degree, these murderers causing much uproar over the world achieved their goal. The Armenian tragedy in the World War I was talked about more and more widely. That was in part due to the increased interest of historians and to the lobbying of the affluent and settled European-American Armenia diaspora as well. The first concrete result was the resolution to designate April 24th as the National Day of Remembrance of Man's Inhumanity to Man in 1975. It was followed by ever more heated disputes in the UNO to condemn Turkey guilty of genocide, a crime already declared to be imprescriptible. Though leaving no stone unturned, Turkey managed to thwart these efforts, but the main reason was that after losing Afghanistan and Iran in 1979, the US government of Jimmy Carter and later Ronald Reagan was not in the position to antagonize its easternmost ally. Nonetheless, there were steps taken in the House of Representatives in 1980 5, 87, and 90 to recognize the Armenian genocide, but the government vetoed them upon Turkish pressure. Interestingly, several Jewish groups representing Turkey lobbied against the recognition, although the Turkish and American Jewish organizations were divided on that issue. Uh, in the polemics going in Israel also at present, the liberal side deems it its moral duty to help the fellow sufferers, while others fear that the recognition of the Armenian genocide would endanger the concept of the Shoah as unique and irreputable. To strengthen cooperation, Turkey began to unknown slaughter the stories of Turkish diplomats saving Jews during the Holocaust. Although the decades old Turkish-Israeli alliance is crumbling, Tel Aviv has not officially condemned Turkey for the crimes against the Armenians, although putting it on the agenda has been raised several times in response to Erdogan's anti-Israeli rhetoric. We have arrived to, to, uh, to the last phase to be discussed now. It comprises, just as in Bloxham's periodization, the events of the 20 years after the collapse of the Soviet Union. As mentioned earlier, with the decline in, its, in the strategic importance of Turkey, more and more European countries began to recognize the events of 1915-1917 as genocide. These resolutions, however, rested on actual political, rather than moral grounds in the majority of the cases. The Italians, for example, took this stance to hinder the integration process of Turkey, which became an official candidate country in 1999, while the Fre French politicians vie for the numerous and economically powerful Armenian votes by keeping the issue in the agenda. South American countries such as Argentina and Uruguay can also be mentioned which passed their laws condemning Turkey upon the pressure of the Armenian diaspora. For the USA, the Turks are still high priority allies as their role played in both Iraqi wars confirms. Though in the early two 2000s, there was another attempt to pass through the House of Representatives the recognition of the genocide. After its failure, the initiative to dissent had come to a standstill. Russia, by contrast, which supported the Armenians in the Karabakh conflict and still stations considerable forces in Armenia, recognized the genocide in 1995. After the success of the so-called football diplomacy, they took an active part together with the Americans to conclude the Armenian-Turkish Accord in 2009 apparently the most important move over the past 20 years. Although in both countries hostile demonstrators greeted the signatory foreign ministers arriving home and neither the Armenian nor the Turkish parliament has ratified the memorandum which actually only proposes the start of bilateral talks, there is maybe some hope that, the future, that in the future arms will be replaced by dialogue. As you will have concluded from the above said, the Armenian issue has not been settled conclusively despite the 100 years or so that passed since. Turkey and Armenia are still fighting for their presumed or real truth in the labyrinth of diplomacy, the former on the basis of its growing economic strength, the latter relying on members of its diaspora. Though emotions are still running high in both countries, perhaps the economic interests will force the parties to agree sooner or later. I for one only hope that it will be soon as possible, not so much earlier a paper like this, might have steered murderous passions in some countries. In enlightened Europe, researchers whose opi opinion diverged from the officially st taken stance may face even legal actions, as Oriental scholar Bernard Lewis case in France proves. Despite these flagrant cases, there are innumerable positive signs that the young generation will come to an understanding. Masses of young Turkish people listen to the songs of the popular American Armenian rock musician Serge Tankian songs, and tens of thousands of Armenian jobless find work and home in major Turkish cities. 
The elaboration of the events in fiction reveals that the slow and difficult process of rea realistic assessment of the past has begun. How this could be accelerated is suggested by a Turkish woman writer, Elif Shafak, who writes in her book, The Bastard of Istanbul, there are some Armenians living in the diaspora who want that the Turks never recognize the genocide. Should the Turks admit it, it would pull the ground from under their feet and would eliminate the strongest and perhaps the only bond that holds them together. Just as the Turks are simply accustomed to denying the committed injustices, the Armenians just as persistently rem remember them because they are accustomed to identifying themselves as the oppressed. Apparently, both sides have to change. Both sides have most grand dogmas that they should get rid of rapidly. Thank you very much.